several weeks we're going to be discussing prayer. Um, I think this is an important topic, and as a church body, we haven't done this in a long time where prayer was an emphasis uh, from the pulpit. And um, I want to spend the next several weeks um, looking at the Lord's Prayer. Now, those of you who are visitors, you may have been attending a, a, a while. Um, we have several people in our church that we're discerning have the gift of preaching, so we let them preach. That's why sometimes you show up on Sunday, somebody else may be standing up here. And uh, for the next several months, I'm going to be hogging the pulpit. I think we only have one person speaking up towards the summer other than myself. It's not that I think it's all about me, but I have a passionate thing on the inside of me that I feel like I got to let this congregation know about. So uh, it's not that anybody's fired or I'm tired of anybody. I'm going to hog it for a little bit. They call that pastoral privilege is what they call that. That's about the only privilege I have. So that we're going to do that. Um, we're going to be looking at prayer. Um, we're going to tackle some of the themes in the Lord's Prayer. I think there's two types of messages that are difficult to preach, Mr. Roper. The first one is one that nobody knows anything about. Those are difficult because you got to lay all this groundwork. You got to sit and, and you got to do all the context. So those are difficult texts to preach. The ones that are really rare and obscure, those are difficult texts to preach because the person doesn't know anything about them. The second ones are the ones that people know the most about because they know so much about them. So if you go to preach on Psalms 23, almost everybody in the room is familiar with that. They had a Sunday school about it. A pastor preached on it. And sometimes they'll turn you off. And this is one of those spots where even non-believers pray this prayer at least one time in their life. I heard a joke about the Lord's Prayer. There was these two Christians having a conversation, and they were kind of debating biblical knowledge. And, and, and one of the guys looks at uh, one of the other guys, and he says, he says to him, he says, um, you, don't, you don't know much as I know about the Bible. You don't even know the Lord's Prayer. He goes, yes, I do. He goes, well, then say it. He goes, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep me. And the guy was like, man, you do know the Lord's Prayer. That's amazing. And so uh, this is a very familiar passage. And today I kind of want to spend my energy and my focus on um, the fact of the matter is uh, I want to stay on that Our Father spot where the writer deals with um, God as the Father. You look, look at me for a second. I know y'all are confused about the screen. I know the screen is a big deal, and I know screens are I want you to look at me because um, I'm cute. No. <laughs> I want us to deal with this. Understanding that our Father is a difficult text. Those two words are difficult because um, there was a time where you had something to play off of when you talked about Father. And, and now if you've had a negative experience with your Father, if your Father has been absentee or if you're father has been too hard on you, if you've had a negative experience with your father, this message, or, or maybe your father's gone. Um, you miss your father. These are very difficult texts because of the word father and what it means. And, and it's easy. Uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of special services in here. Every time I have an idea for a special service, somebody goes, well, you can't do that because, you know, if you celebrate Mother's Day, there's somebody who can't be a mother. And you got to be careful. And if, if you celebrate Father's Day, there's somebody who's a father. And if you're not careful, we can't celebrate anything. And if you're not careful, we can't talk about anything. So there, there is this point where you get to a place in the kingdom where you're, where, you're, where you're able to not let your emotions be your compass. It's okay to feel your emotions. It's okay to know that your emotions are there. God did not give you emotions so that you're compass. So when you feel angry, that don't mean you can cuss them out, okay? Because your emotions don't get to, you can say, that makes me mad, I'm angry, but my emotions aren't my compass. And so as we talk about Father, this can bring up all kinds of emotions. You need to know that the, the, that the emotions that you're feeling are not your compass this morning, okay? Amen? And I need you to lean in and take in some information on this message. Um, Jesus starts off in Matthew chapter 6. He starts off this chapter uh, uh, really going after giving, really going after prayer, going after fasting. He starts off talking about giving. He says, if you're giving to be seen, you're giving with the wrong motive. 
He's not saying that you can't give publicly. He's saying, what is your motive when you give publicly? He's not saying not to pray publicly. He's, he's, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kill that because if you go to Chick-fil-A, you can pray publicly. But he wants to know, what is your motive for playing publicly? What, what are you doing to be seen? Are you trying to use big words? And some people who you talk to on the phone, they're really uneducated, but then they start to pray and they get all of a sudden, they all of a sudden know all these big words. Lord, in all your proclivity and structure, and they start using all these big words. Like, man, he don't talk like that when he's with us. But when he prays all of a sudden, when she prays all of a sudden, she has big words and he has big words and they're repetitious and they're very vain. They say the same thing over and over again. Jesus is going, prayer reveals your motives. Prayer reveals sickness in your heart. How you talk to God and what you want to pray for tells us a lot about you. If you want to know what your biggest problem is, write down what you want to pray for. And if you find out it's a bunch of material things, that's revealing something to you. If you find out it's all your prayers are about relationships, that's revealing something to you. If you're finding out all your prayers are trust issues, that's revealing something to you. So prayer reveals the heart. It's not just talking to God. And Jesus is saying that we have heart issues. And don't be like religious people when you pray. He's like, don't be like the religious people. They just start talking and babbling in vain repetition. It's a knee-jerk reaction. They don't have any thought to it. They don't think about it. They just do it. And they want to be seen. And they want to be heard. They want to be noticed. Jesus is challenging us. He uses this word Father 17 times in the Sermon on the Mount. 17 different times Jesus says Father in reference to God the Father. And this is revolutionary. This is revolutionary. God is not intimate. God is not accessible. And we make None of the Jews now, but that's what they were supposed. God told them, you can't run up on me. God told them, you can't connect with me. They're rightfully thinking at this point in time in regards to God to a certain aspect. You can't just run up on a holy God. You and me are unholy. We can't just run up on a holy God. Moses said, Lord, I'll, I'll follow you. I'll do what you tell me to do, but show me your glory. And God mooned him. He said, you can just see my backside because if I showed you all of me, you would, you would burn up and consume. Your God is so holy. Our minds, that's why Jesus says, our Father, hallowed be your name. He's like, he's holy. He should be adored. He is set apart. He is, his character is so splendor. We can't wrap our minds around how holy and splendor God is. And just. He's all those things. He is the righteous judge. And he's greater and smarter and more terrific than our minds can even handle. And so Jesus is like, man, this holy God, this terrific God, this splendor God, this God who we can't step into his presence. Jesus is saying, I'm bringing something new on the scene. I'm saying he's daddy. I call him daddy. Daddy in the Greek, Abba, which would our translation would be Daddy. Like a little kid. Here is God bringing himself down and calling the Father Daddy and saying, I'm the leader of the pack. If Jesus calls him Daddy, he, he's the most, Jesus is the most masculine man to ever live. And if the, the most masculine man to ever live can call the Father Daddy, there's no man in this room exempt from humbling themselves and saying, Daddy, I need you, Daddy. Talk to me, Daddy. And some of us struggle with this because our earthly fathers are disappointing. Papa was a rolling stone. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> the pastor just quote the temptations at church? Yes, you know. The kids don't know that song. I think I played it one time for you, didn't I? I mean, I grew mad up a little bit. Um, some of us struggle because Daddy... I don't have an example. And then you hear sermons, they talk about their dad, the whole sermon, and that's good, but no matter how good your dad is, he's not this daddy. No matter how great your dad is, he's not this daddy. And some of us have good dads. I think about Rayburn's dad, man, just, man, Rayburn's dad, just uh, solid. But Father in heaven, he's up over all of that. So you kids can take your dads off the hook. They're not perfect, they make mistakes. 
Yeah, they say stupid stuff, and then after that is the second stupid thing they're going to say. It's, there's a greater daddy who always gets it right when he talks. There's a greater daddy who knows exactly what you need to hear. And I prefer that you would talk to him before you talk to yours. Okay? We have this. Now, to see God as the Father, that's a work of the Spirit in your heart. Okay, Galatians 4, 6 says, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Daddy, Father, Abba, Father. So if you don't see God as a father, that you need to pray for the spirit to do a work in your heart. Because the only way that you receive this truth is that the spirit does the work of, in your heart about who the father really is. You have a dad. There's, if you're a believer, nobody in this room is fatherless. And that's a tough truth. And if you still have your father alive, you can sit there and go, yeah, yeah, amen. <laughs> Hard to receive that if your fathers went on. So our challenge here is to be empathetic to those who have lost their father. But if you've lost your father, the greater truth in this room is that you have a heavenly father who's perfect in wisdom, perfect in strength, perfect in love, perfect in grace, just promises to provide, protect, and to be present for the rest of your days. Oh, that's good news, church. That's a praise break right there, church. That's a Let me help some of my white friends. That's a praise break right there. That's a praise break right there. This heavenly father, heavenly daddy, all right? First principle on your note sheet, he is the father to many. Say amen. He's not just the Methodist church, not just the Baptist church, not just black people, not just white people, not just whatever it is. He's not exclusive to one group of people. Matter of fact, this prayer is a plural prayer. The reason why we're doing this series is I was out to eat with Murray and I got to praying and it dawned on me while we were eating that he said, give us, remember that? this day, our daily bread. Now, when I get to eat, I'm happy. I don't care if y'all get to eat. <laughs> I'm eating. Glory to God, I earned this belly, you know. Glory to God, I'm happy. But the prayer is our daily bread. That's why we give a sack of food after every service, because we don't just celebrate us eating. We have to make sure that everybody in this group is eating, because it's our daily bread. It's a plural prayer. It's a plural. Now, 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 let me help you. Some of you are clapping. You're going to be done clapping probably now. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. Um, America is about individual rights, and that's okay politically. It's about the individual. The kingdom is about us. Be careful when you tell our kids personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Be careful. That's an American term. Did not exist until America existed. You know what I'm saying? That's a westernized thinking. He doesn't just reconcile you to yourself and to him. He reconciles you to a group of people. And we know who's holy by how you can interact with this group of crazy. I can't say what I want to say, but you know what I'm saying. I almost got in trouble, Angie, for real. They're going to take a vote if I say what I thought I was going to say. Whew, that was close. You are, God judges you. He says, you will know that they are my disciples by how well they love in the group. This is a plural prayer. So it's not just one person can call him daddy. Everybody that has received Christ can say, he my daddy too. He my daddy too. You can go, <laughs> I almost called this tournament. I almost, I almost named this, who's your daddy? I almost, you know, had the Maury Povich up in here, take some DNA tests up in here. Ain't that show a trip? The woman runs off the stage. He's like, thank you. He's celebrating. I told you. This is a terrible show. This man does this every day. And if you're watching that, you're coming forward in the name of Jesus. <laughs> coming forward. Who's your daddy? This is important stuff. Robert Morgan, the theologian, says, man enters the presence of the father and then prays as one of the great family. First, we are a big church. We're in a rural community, and rural communities are big. In the midst of this bigness, we can't forget we're supposed to be family. Come on. Come on. In the midst of all that's going on, 
from the least most deserved person in here to have a family. We have to be family. We have to, we have, to have some uncomfortable conversations. We have to share our bedrooms. You have to, give, you have to take some hand-me-downs on the jeans. <laughs> Can't take your brother's jeans. I was like, man, I want my own jeans. My brother was bigger than me, so I was sagging when it wasn't popular, man. I was just, draws was just wrong. My draws was just, don't let a big wind come. I'm gone. I <laughs> said, man, my brother was weird. I said, Lord, I don't dress like this. I don't dress like this. This is family. This is family. You guys who go missing 12 weeks. I'm letting you know, you're in biblical error. Don't believe that. Don't believe that guy who's out there fishing right now going, you don't have to be at church. I ain't telling you to come to the institution, but you better be around God's people. It's a plural prayer. I was watching uh, Shark Week. I don't never really watch that, but I was absolutely from the channels when Shark Week was on, and I caught the end of it. And the guy was like, it's just like we thought. It's just like we thought. And he's holding up this half-eaten fish. He's like, it's just like we thought. When fish swim alone, sharks go after them. You out here swimming alone, the enemy goes, ha ha, let's go get her. Let's go get him. I got him. He wants you in here. It's something about community. The enemy has to fight because he ain't just got one of us. He got some brothers. And you know how that is. You grew up on the streets. You ain't just fighting me, doc. There's a whole bunch of Negroes coming. We coming. We coming in record proportion. You understand what I'm saying? There's a whole bunch of us coming. And the enemy, did I say the wrong word? I'd just be freaking y'all out. <laughs> all right? Look, look what Galatians 3.26 says. For you are all children of God, all of you who said yes to Christ and his finished work of God, finished work on the cross. All of you said yes. You're all his children. And some of you, some of us get angry. You're 32. They're two. You mad that a two-year-old ain't doing what you do. Everybody ain't the same age in here. Everybody ain't the same stage. Some of us don't know how to get the boogers out of our nose yet. We're working on it. Some of us ain't potty trained. <laughs> amen. Say amen. We need a brother or sister to help a brother out. That's what we need. We need you to come alongside us and help us, not judge us. We family. I wish I, I should have done that. I should have played the sister sledge in here. You know what I'm saying? We uh, fan. We should have been here jamming this morning because we can't lose this in our bigness. We're blessed. We have a full room. This used to be our Easter service. Remember that, Scott? This used to be our Easter Sunday. We'd be all over, slobbering all over ourselves, excited. Oh, you know, <laughs> just pumped up. The room is packed. You know, we can't get so big that we forget. We have to be there for one another, for real. If you say you're going to pray for somebody, put it in your phone, write it down, pray for them. That's your brother or sister in Christ. Family, all right? And all have been united with Christ in baptism and have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. Listen, in this nation right now, I'm, I'm telling you right now, this is controversial, and I know there are people in here, you know, I love, I, I don't, I'm not ashamed to be an African American, but more and more I'm learning that I am a kingdom citizen. We are one race now, folks, and at some point in time, you got to strip it down, and you got to invite me over, and I get to eat your chicken too, all right? And you got to get over yourself, and I get to come in your house, and I invite you over my house, and you get to eat my food too, and I'll try a casserole. You won't like it, but I'll try it. All right. I'll do the best I can. None of that is going. That's the text. I'm the messenger. So you got to go talk to the text. You got to go talk to God. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female. There's just one group. God sees one. And you're a part of that. So we got to get over ourselves. And you know, even the people, we don't like people who sin differently than us. You know what I'm saying? So you start judging people because of how they, okay, I'll keep going because I can tell by some of y'all's faces. I don't like that. He ain't going there. It's not this morning. He ain't. <laughs> and so that's, that's our challenge. We're one in Christ. This whole prayer is about community. This whole prayer is about being social, that you've been called to exist amongst God's people. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. This is what God was prophesying about to Abraham in Genesis. You, you are, he told Abraham to look up there at those stars. You are one of those stars that God is talking to Abraham about. You are one of those stars. You, he was pointing, look at those stars, Abraham. And it's like, okay, I see DJ. All right, all right. He's flickering. <laughs> you know, he sees, he's seen you. He knew you was going to be in the family. Don't, don't, don't. Do me a favor. Church, look at me for real. Don't kick anybody out of the family. As, 
<laughs> you can, you know, you may pick a different bedroom to be, you know, go to. <laughs> but don't kick anybody out of the family. Especially if you haven't tried to connect with them. Don't judge me till you know my story. At least, at least hear my story before you judge me. At least know what I was up against before you judge me. And when we start seeing ourselves not just as one, but as us, I mean, how often do we pray us? All of our songs are a lot of times, you know, me, my, in our music. That's why the hymns are so awesome because it's always us. It's always us in the hymns. Today's new songs, you know, it's, it's me, I love you, I love you, Jesus, I wish. And we have become spiritually narcissistic. Where it's just me, 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 me. Jesus said, our Father, there's more than you on this planet, Selah. There's more than you. You're not the only one here. And that's a challenge. The second principle is that, that we, we, we can take this home. God is our daddy. I mean, we can take that home. We have a daddy now. That is so awesome. We have a daddy. Look what John 1.12 says. But to all who believed him and accepted him. Here's the deal. If you haven't believed in Christ, if you haven't accepted Christ, you're not in the family. And you got a pastor here who loves you enough to tell you that. If you haven't believed him and accepted him, what do you mean, DJ? That he was born of a virgin, that he lived a holy, sin-free life, all right? That he died on the cross and was the payment of our sins on the cross. He went down into the grave and was resurrected by the power of God's spirit. And now when I say yes to him, that same spirit resides in me and changes my life. I don't have to try to fix myself. The Holy Spirit comes into my life and starts, change, it starts doing urban warfare in my heart and saying, get rid of that, get rid of that, change that, change that, change that. And I believe he's coming back for me again. And I get amongst a group of people. That's what I'm talking about. That's believing and accepting Christ for those of you who need a definition. You don't get to say, I'm saved, but don't you judge me. That, eh, no. Bant. Those who have believed him and accepted him, he gave the right there's almost a sense of entitlement in that statement. I can now expect him to be my daddy. I go, Daddy, I don't like this. <laughs> He's like, well, did you go to church today? Yeah, well, welcome to the team. Welcome. I always tell people that, that, that this church was perfect until you joined. It was. It was doing so good. And then you came. It was doing so good. And then you showed up. I mean, what, I think some people think that we manufacture church people. And they get on Facebook, 12, 12 reasons why I don't go to church. I'm just like, that is the most narcissistic, selfish thing. We're not manufacturing people. They came out from the world. What do you think they come from? They came from the world. Now, you know, it's like you can either be out there in the flood drowning and dealing with the flood and drowning, or you can be up here in this ark cleaning dung and cleaning up after these nasty animals and smelling stuff and flies and mosquitoes and dealing with the ark or flood. There ain't no other option, folks. What, what do y'all think this is? Our challenge is, I'm saying, you have this right now. You have been a Adopted, no longer orphan, no longer fatherless. You have a family and you have a daddy. And now because of your acceptance and belief in Christ, you have a right to become. That's a process. We talk sanctification. So you older children need to chill out. We're all in a stage of becoming. We're all in this stage of sanctification. One day I'm going to learn how to grab a Kleenex and blow my nose. You know, one day. We're all in this process of becoming, and we've all got that right because of Jesus Christ. So I got a couple things I wanted to throw at you before I close. <laughs> all right? God being our daddy is God being our daddy is about our identity. And that's blank on your note sheet. God being our daddy is about our identity. He's saying, I want you to understand who you are. No longer any need for any insecurity. No longer any need for the Darwin brain. You feel like you have to protect yourself. You feel like you have to preserve your own success. This is what the enemy does. You become successful. You don't acknowledge the daddy made you successful. And then you think you have to protect and preserve your own success. And then you start acting Darwinistic. You start manipulating. You start gossiping. You start hustling. Because you think you got here without the daddy. You need to understand without daddy, the Bible says promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from the Lord. So anytime 
anytime you're promoted, you got to acknowledge daddy's work in your life because you can't protect and preserve this success. Only the father can protect and preserve my success because he's the one who had the power to give it to me. He's the one that has the power to take it away. And so we've got to get our identity here. We've got to ask the Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts that we see ourselves as God's children, not as Christians, as children of God. The Bible only uses the word Christian one time. We call ourselves Christians over and over again. It uses citizenship and children over and over again. We don't use those words. We use the man-made word. And I'm not trying to be legalistic, but think about what that does to your identity. Even when you have messed up last week, you're still his child. Do you disown your kids when they mess up? Well, I better not ask that question. Some of y'all... Press your hearts. Some of y'all had them in youth group and y'all disowned them. But good parenting doesn't disown their kids. They still got your last name, glory to God. You can't, you can't take that from them. God is saying, I know what you did. I was there. You're still my kid. It's this unconditional love. And you got to see your identity there. All right? Look what 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved. We are God's children when? Now. If John 1.12 is true to you, you are God's children. Come on, help me preach. You're God's children. Now, now man. Go. When you hit the floor Monday morning, I don't care if you got overdrafts galore in your account. I don't care if you got, you can get on all your accounts and you can just see that money just going up. Everybody's going, we don't know who that is. <laughs> I <don't, laughs> even I was thinking, that, like, Lord, who is that person? I need to meet them. All of us are God's children. This ain't about money. This ain't about who, who, who I, I, don't, I don't go to playmaker. This ain't about who lives the perfect. This is about I have daddy's DNA in me. The Holy Spirit is in my heart doing a work. I'm a child of God. Don't, don't leave your day like that. Tim Keller, great theologian. You can buy any of his books and you'll be okay in my humble opinion. Any of Tim Keller's books, you'll be all right. He says the Bible is basically saying that our real problem is that every one of us is building our identity on something besides Jesus. It is so easy. To, and, 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 and those of you who are leaders in the church, I want you to pay attention to me. Those of you who, who do stuff for Jesus, it's easy for ministry to become your identity. Instead of saying, you're a child of God, I'm a bass player at first of the church. I'm a guitar player. I lead worship. I'm a pastor. Instead of telling people, I'm a child of God, it's easy for how you function in the kingdom to become your identity, and God didn't want that. No matter if you're a, from the pastor to the youngest kid in this building, child of God. Child of God. And our real problem is we place our stakes in things that cannot give us what knowing that you're a child of God can give you. So this is why we overspend. This is why we chase after really things. This is why our teenagers have to have a boyfriend, have to have a girlfriend. This is why we overly obsess about becoming a great basketball player because our identities are in things that at the end of the day cannot help us with our heart and with our soul. And we make some very terrible decisions and we become really insecure. Every one of us, if we're not careful, are building our lives on something besides Jesus Christ. So you got to start doing some assessing here. Our Father, do you build your life on being a child of this daddy? God being our daddy is about our intimacy, this connection to the Father. This is revolutionizing because... <laughs> You can't connect with God like this. Matter of fact, the Jews' description of God was he was in this room up here behind this curtain, and you could only go there once a year, and the most holy priest could only go back there, and it was called the Holy of Holies. And, and some, some historians and some theologians believe they would tie a rope around the priest's ankle, and when he went in there, they didn't know how long he was going to be in there, and if he was in there too long and they didn't see any movement, they would pull him out because that means he died in the presence of God. All right? And so Jews have this belief that this religion has taught them that there's no access to the Father. And Jesus says, when you pray, you have access. When you pray, you have an intimate relationship. It's about intimacy. It's about connection. If I tell you a story, you guys promise not to judge me. I want to hear you say it. You guys promise not to judge me. 
Lord Laurel just said, I promise. I'm holding you to that, Laurel. Okay, so, so, so um, y'all know I do a lot of speaking all around the, the nation. <laughs> this is terrible. So Tom Brady's having this football camp, and they want me to come speak at it. So I said, I'm not telling nobody. Because it seems like every time I tell somebody about something cool like this, it, something happens. So I had to get up like at 4.30, catch my flight, go to Boston to preach at this camp. Man, I am pumped. 3,000 kids. 3,000 kids. <laughs> so, all right, got to leave at 4.45. Ask me what time I wake up. Go ahead, ask me. Six. Flight leaves at seven. I drove very expeditiously to Kansas City. KCI. I get there and I miss my flight. So I'm looking for another flight, looking for another flight. They came find one to the next day. I called the guy who's doing the camp. He said, man, we got some speakers here that are plan B, plan C. <laughs> we'll just go with them. And so they, so I miss out on this opportunity to go speak at Tom Brady's camp. Now, I just made that story up just now. <laughs> but I can tell by your faces you were disappointed that I missed Tom Brady's camp. And some of you every day miss God's camp. Some of you every day miss your appointment with God. You guys were disappointed with me missing Tom Brady, but the Father, the creator of the universe. I just lied. That's not true. So don't leave out of here telling that story. <laughs> I just want to see your face. Some of you are like, oh, my gosh. We need, we need to fire him. He blew it. Some of you would rather go see Brett Favre than wake up and talk to the daddy. Brett Favre can't do nothing for you. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if I want him to, to be honest with you. The reality is, every day we miss an appointment with the Father. And I don't want you to feel guilt, but there should be some disappointment. The Father's here, and I'm not talking to him. I'm not being intimate. You know, the Jews would give anything for this. They'd give anything for this. They, they, they would pull lots to be that most high priest. That's the highest calling. Now everybody, because of Christ's sacrifice, is the most high priest. And we're just going, I don't have time. I really don't have time. I'm sorry I'm so busy. Daddy? You don't have time for daddy? Shame on us. Amen? Shame on us. Look what Romans 8.15 says. I made that story up. You guys' faces. That was good. For the, <laughs> I'll repent later. The pastor just lied in his sermon. That is awesome. For the spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the spirit makes you who? God's children. Say it. Some of you can't say it. Some of you men. Oh, grown man. When's he going to be done? <laughs> Brother, you're really laughing hard over here. By the Spirit's power, we cry out to God, Father, my Father, Daddy, my Daddy. He didn't say we whisper. He said we cry out. We cry out loud. It's heard. It's audible. Daddy. You know how it is when Daddy comes home and the kids are little. It's, moms, you are, it's, it's over for you, right? You're like, I done been here all day with you bad brats. Here come daddy. He ain't about to do nothing either. He's about to watch the Royals. But here he comes, daddy, daddy. He ain't about to do nothing. Women just looking at you. You're going to put some laundry in, you're going to sit there and stare at me. What you going to do? Right? Daddy. That kid-like nature. Dad's home. Dad's here. Kids don't care. Mall. McDonald's. Daddy. You know, have you ever watched those show, don't watch, you can only watch one video on YouTube where the dad's off in the military and then he comes back and they surprise him at a basketball game and you try to act like you're not going to cry, but you be crying. <laughs> man, my allergies, man, turn the air conditioner off, you know, <laughs> you know, and you watch it and the kid doesn't care. Like he's talking to his friends before his basketball game and then he sees his dad. Oh my God, he takes off. Daddy, daddy, boom, grabs his neck. They're hugging each other. Daddy, he doesn't care who's watching. Some of you can't come forward. But if you really knew the Father, you don't care who's watching. You don't care who's judging you. And I don't care what you think. Daddy's here. I'm going to hug him. I'm going to hold him. Daddy's here. I'm a kid. Some of you are so serious and really mature, and you do no kingdom good. God bless you. You don't even know Daddy. Daddy. God being our Daddy is about our influence. Like, 
You're influential now because of your DNA and because who your father is. We know this in the practical terms. We know this. If you have a father who's got a good reputation in the community, that gives you some access. Oh, here comes the Jones boy. Come on in. Yeah, go on in. If your dad has a bad reputation, you don't have access. <laughs> you better say, no, don't you let that. Don't you. I don't want to see that Jones boy at our house again. You know what I'm saying? You have this perfect father who is holy in nature, holy in character. His reputation is untainted. Now you're his kid. It's going to give you access. It's going to give you influence. It's not just somebody doing it when you do it because of who your daddy is. That's why Jesus, you know, makes it clear in Matthew. He makes it clear in Matthew. He's like, yo, people are going to see your good works, and they're going to glorify the Father in heaven. Look what Romans 8, 13 says. I'm almost there. You guys are doing good. I'm proud of you. Two more slides. But through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your seven angels. You will live. You are led by the Spirit of God and are the children of God. Uh Lastly, God being our daddy is about our inheritance. So many churches start here. So many preachers start here because it can get you excited. There are some things that you inherited that are earthly good, and there are some things that you inherited that are earthly bad. I'll explain here in a second. There are some things that you inherit in, in God's kingdom that on the earth, they're good. Then there's some things that you inherited from the Father that are bad. What do you mean? Man, when you serve God, he has a ways of blessing you. The Bible says, eye hasn't seen Ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered in your heart what God has in store for you. God has a way of making things right and doing things well. But suffering is an inheritance in the kingdom. Did you just hear me? You inherit suffering in the kingdom. And we live in this pain-free culture. We're, we're overly protective. You know, you, you put body armor on your kid and they go on training wheels. I don't understand. I'm like, he's got training wheels. He's good. No, yeah, helmet, elbow pads, knee pads, shin guards, gloves with the fingers cut out of them. And he can't, he can't, he can't, he can't pedal because he's got on this body armor. <laughs> and he's like, you don't want him to fall. We live in this really uh, germ-free sanitizer. Get your sanitizer app. And when you're in the kingdom, you inherit suffering. Jesus said, no man is above his master. If they treated me with hate and contempt, guess what you inherit? You're going to inherit some hate and contempt. You're going to inherit some suffering in the kingdom. And God being our daddy is about this inheritance, our inheritance, everlasting life, our inheritance. We have all these precious promises that we have inherited because of who our daddy is. Look what Romans 8, 17 says. Now, my last scripture. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we were to share his glory, uh uh-oh, uh-oh. Y'all was wondering if I had a scripture to back up what I just was saying, huh? If we were to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. So if we're going to play football together, you come into two a days, dog. Could you imagine, like, I don't come to not, I don't come to one game. Would you like this, man? I don't come to one game. I don't come to nothing. But at the state championship, I got a uniform on and some pads on, and y'all win. I'm like, we won! We won! I didn't come to one practice. I didn't come to... He's like, how are you trying to share in the glory? You didn't suffer with us. You didn't come to weights. <laughs> you, didn't come, you didn't play in all the tough games. I'm talking about, we won! We won! We won! It's like, no, you are going to share in some of this suffering. There's no avoiding it. If you want the glory, there's suffering. And we want to avoid this. We want to get around this. And we're asking Daddy to keep it from happening. And Daddy's going, no, there's some things that are tailored designed just for you to share in. And it's a part of your inheritance. It's a part of your identity. It's a part of who you are. And when I was a kid, I'll close, Cornell. How about that? They sang a song that said, by and by, when the morning comes, All the saints of God together at home will tell a story how we overcome and will understand it better by and by. You're not going to understand it all down here right now, and I wish you could, and I don't know what you would do with it if you could. But one day we're going to get up to heaven, it's going to all make sense. And we're going to be telling stories how we overcome. And it's going to all make sense in the end because we are family We are God's children, and this daddy takes care of his kids. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, 
We first want to pray for that person who feels like they're outside. We want to pray for the orphans, the people who don't believe in Jesus or don't feel worthy of God's love. We pray that your spirit would do something supernatural in their hearts that they may know if they say yes to Jesus, that makes them a part of our family. That being a part of being a child of God is not about doing. Being a child of God is about being. We get this inheritance because we are being in the right family. And Lord, I just pray that there's somebody here that they would know right now as they sit in that chair. If they just say yes in their heart, they're in your family. Right now, if they just say yes, they're in your family. They're in your family. Those of us who are older brothers and sisters, help us to notice younger brothers and sisters in this room. Help us to kind of get out of our comfort zones, Dad. Help us get out of our comfort zones and help us to be mentors to our younger brothers and sisters. Help us to show some people how to blow their noses. Help us to do some mentoring. Help us to get out of roles and get into a circle. Help us to see not just individuals, but see this whole beautiful family, all ages, all races, all different types of preferences. Not just men, not just women, not just old, also the young. Help us to remember that this is a church, but this church, greater than that, is a family. Help us to pray like this. Help us to pray more plural, less individually. And help us to not just be concerned with our own selves doing well, but become concerned about others that they do well. We love you, Daddy. We love you and we thank you for what our older brother Jesus did on the cross, allowing us now to no longer be orphans. Help us to walk in that truth. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Lord, remember the auction and the food that's being given to us at the auction. I'm going to pray for that now. Help it to be a blessing to us. Uh, Do a work in the chili that it doesn't destroy our stomachs, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray.